God's grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Tonight's theme calls us to return from false witness. It's the eighth commandment that is speaking of. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Luther, in his meeting in the small catechism, says this. We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. During the days ahead of his crucifixion, Jesus was subject to the worst lies, betrayals, slander that one could imagine. False testimony at its most treacherous and heinous extreme. The most respected man in society, the chief priest, held a kangaroo court, as we would call it today, ignoring recognized standards of law or justice, intentionally disregarding a court's legal or ethical obligations. They had brought charges against Jesus, so ludicrous, they couldn't get two people, two witnesses to agree on what Jesus said, except for two that, well, they, they remember that Jesus said, um, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. For the Jewish leaders, their goal was not just to hurt his reputation, it was to crush Jesus, to rid this rogue rabbi from interfering with their control of the people to garner permission to have him executed. Accusing Jesus of blasphemy, the real blasphemers slapped and spit on God and handed God the sentence of death. Adding insult to injury, his friend and supporter, Peter, denied knowing him at all, calling down curses to witness to this truth, spelled with the capital letters L-I-E. Another disciple, Judas, recognized finally his dark part of the betrayal in the garden too late, and he tried to give those 30 pieces of coin back the blood money, as it was known, but he couldn't. So he hanged himself in utter shame, further to betraying Jesus by disregarding the promise of Jesus that he will forgive. And before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, the people yelled for the hardened criminal Barabbas to be set free, not Jesus, implying that the bigger criminal was Jesus. Yet one more betrayal from the people Jesus loved, fed, ate with, and served. And just a few days earlier, they welcomed him into the community, into Jerusalem as a king. And again, except for John, all the other disciples had abandoned the teacher betraying the one they walked with for three years, cowering in fear for their lives in some nondescript room. Their witness was a fear, not love. Cowardness, not faithfulness. These actions, well, that these actions clearly conflict with the Eighth Commandment is an understatement. Breaking the Eighth Commandment so monstrously is not typical, but we certainly don't see ourselves so openly hateful, deprived, weak, and evil, yet we must be vigilant in using extreme comparisons as a way to excusing our own minor deficiencies. Sin is sin, no matter the size. Before God, there is no such thing as little sins. They all convict us to death. In its most obvious meaning, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, is first and foremost 
not speaking in the most favorable language about a person. It was the author of Proverbs who speaks truthfully of the obvious beast called false witness. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. In another verse, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. And yet another verse, a truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. Martin Luther, as he does so well, stretches our understanding of the commandment, and in doing so, he lays the weight of the law firmly in our lap. The commandment, he says, forbids all sins of the tongue by which we may injure or offend our neighbor. And he writes this, it is common, it is a common pernicious plague that everyone who would rather Everyone would rather hear evil than good about their neighbors. Even though we ourselves are evil, we cannot tolerate it when anyone speaks evil of us. Instead, we want to hear the whole world say golden things of us. I love that, golden things of us. Yet we cannot bear it when someone says the best things about others. Our false testimony often consists of rumors and innuendos that we utter about other people. The whispered, did you hear? And the murmuring that says, you're not going to believe, that slips off our tongue, insidious. The half-truths and the outright lies we speak about brothers and sisters without ever speaking directly to them. The slander and backbiting we too often delight in participating in. We are prone to taking a particular characteristic of someone or perceive weakness and inflating them into a, well, ridiculous caricature, sometimes to make someone look silly, but usually to show our superiority so we can hurt them. Luther boils it down to this. No one shall use the tongue to harm a neighbor, whether friend or foe, no one shall say anything evil of a neighbor, whether true or false, unless it is done with proper authority or for that person's improvement. We all have broken this commandment in various degrees, but there aren't really various degrees. There's only one degree, and that's completely. You have broken it. Each of us has. And each of us is and will. And you are deserving of the punishment for this sin. Jesus endured all the wicked false witness in Jerusalem, not even trying to defend himself. He did not retaliate. He did not call on his heavenly father to step in to shield him from this travesty, these hurtful actions. Jesus allowed the sin of the world to rest its unbearable weight on him. Unbearable for us, but not for him. He had to. It was the only way we could return from false witness. Joe, Jesus chose the course of willful submission to the cross in order to reconcile you to God and win forgiveness for all your false witness, hurtful attitude, and lies. Pleading your case before the Father, Christ speaks the truth. He says, here is another brother or sister that I bought with my price of my life, brought into our marvelous light. He is your son. She is your daughter. They are covered by my forgiveness. Your sins are not amplified by God. They are not even spoken of by God. Jesus has paid off the charges against you in full. The price was his blood and his death, which he gladly gave to you. No longer does the Father see your son. No, he sees only his loving son, standing next to you. 
your salvation, but your salvation invites you to follow a higher and a different path. He invites you to return to him, leave and turn behind your sins of false witness and see that he has something different in mind for you. The fear and love we have from God directs us to speak of our neighbors in the very best of terms, erring, in fact, on speaking too well of them, as opposed to what we think is a harsh reality. If we hear a lie, we challenge it, but only if we are protecting the reputation of another. We are faithful to a fault, loving even those who bear false witness against us, putting the best construction on what we don't understand. Withholding callous judgment, we do not tell lies about our neighbor. We don't portray them, slander them, or hurt his or her reputation. But we defend them. We speak well of them and explain everything in the kindest ways. To do anything else is to reject the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.